The Lord's Reign in Zion Zion's future triumph, the coming Messiah, a little baby born in the little town of Bethlehem. And a mighty angel hands John a little book to eat. Today on 3 in 1, as we consider Micah chapters 4 through 5 and Revelation chapter 10. Now remember, last time we said that Micah is considered by many to be a mini Isaiah, covering much of the same territory, including prophecy of coming judgment, prophecy that looks past judgment on into restoration, and then pleading with God's people to repent. So the prophecy of coming judgment was found in chapters 1 through 3, and then in chapters 4 through 7, there's prophecy that looks past judgment, all the way to future restoration of the nation. And then the pleading to repent is mixed throughout the whole book. So let's look briefly at some of Micah's prophecies that concern future restoration. Listen to Micah chapter 4 verse 1. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and the peoples shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples, and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all people walk each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Doesn't that sound excellent? I mean, I can't wait. I mean, this war that we're in gets wearisome sometimes, doesn't it? I mean, oh, for the day that we can walk with God unhindered. That's just going to be a great day. Now, Silas and I, my oldest son, were eating lunch a while back, and he asked me, Dad, how do we know that the Bible is true? And his question struck me. I mean, being my oldest, I was wondering when he would start to ask questions like that. So I said, good question, Silas. And we started to walk simply through an acronym that I learned long ago that helps guide the answer to such a great question. And the acronym is MAPS, M-A-P-S. M stands for Manuscript Evidence, A stands for Archaeological Evidence, P stands for Prophecy, and S stands for Statistical Probability. Now, we don't have the time now to walk through all of the manuscript and archaeological evidence, but let's talk briefly about prophecy and statistical probability. See, there are over 300 prophecies just about the Messiah, fulfilled in the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And one of those prophecies is found in our reading today in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Listen. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. So, a prophecy. Out of all the cities in Israel, God chose the little town of Bethlehem. And he chose to announce his choice over 700 years before the Messiah would be born in that manger in the little town of Bethlehem. So, what's the statistical probability of a man being born in the little town of Bethlehem at that time? And how does that statistical probability exponentially change when you combine that specific prophecy with all of the other very specific prophecies concerning the birth, life, ministry, death, and resurrection of the Messiah? Well, if you want to read the actual math involved, I highly encourage you to search for Science Speaks by Dr. Peter Stoner. It, it's an excellent work. It's Science Speaks by Dr. Peter Stoner. It's on the statistical probability of one man fulfilling all 300 plus prophecies concerning the Messiah. And I think you'll see, and I think you'll agree, that it pushes it into the realm of impossibility unless there is a God who is real and really does know and really can see the end and the beginning all at the same time. 
like what we saw today in Revelation chapter 10, as John was granted a vision of the end, of the end times. In verse 1 we read, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand. And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Man, more on those seven thunders in just a moment. But first, let's work our way through this mighty angel. Well, we won't actually work our way through. That's probably the wrong way to say it because by the looks of it, I'm not sure there are any created creatures that could get their way through or get by this This mighty angel, clothed with a cloud, a rainbow on his head. This guy was huge. I mean, face like the sun, feet like pillars of fire. This guy was powerful. Right foot on the sea, left foot on the land. A loud cry, a loud voice like a lion when he roars. This guy wasn't a guy. This guy was another mighty angel. Now, which angel was it? We don't know. But some aspects of the description would fit well with the angel being the archangel Michael. See, Jude and Revelation say that on more than one occasion, Michael will battle with, will fight with Satan himself. Imagine what that fight would actually look like given the description of this mighty angel. Daniel chapter 12 tells us that in the time of the end, Michael will stand up during a time of tribulation. Listen to Daniel chapter 12 verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. Now, whether or not this is Michael the archangel, we don't know. But we do know that he is another mighty angel. And we do know that he has something small in his hand. He had a little book open in his hand. And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and cried with a loud voice as with a lion when he roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. So what did the seven thunders say? (laughs) We don't know. And here's... It's somewhat clear that God doesn't want us to know. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that there are still Bible mysteries. It tells us that we still don't know everything that there is to know about the scriptures. It tells us that there are still going to be mysteries revealed to us in heaven. Some mysteries that will be sweet when they are revealed and some mysteries that will be bitter when they're revealed. So since we don't know and since John was told to seal those things up, we should just move on. Shouldn't we? But why did God mention them at all? I mean, why did he inspire John to write down anything at all concerning the seven thunders? I I don't know. And that's all I have to say about that right now, I guess. So verse five says, The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, and that there should be no more delay, no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servants the prophets. This is intense, right? It reminds me of what what Gabriel gave to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, as he described this same time. Gabriel gave Daniel a specific time, a specific timeline, and specific events that must happen during that timeline. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, Gabriel said, Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. I mean, that's a lot to happen in 70 weeks. But as we found out in our study through Daniel, Gabriel gave a timeline that included 70 weeks of years or 70 sevens, 70 groupings of seven-year period. So 490 years were determined 
for God's people and for the holy city to do all these things, to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. But as we also saw in our study of, of Daniel, this timeline is broken up into several parts. We don't have time to go through all of it now, but let's just say the two main parts were the 69 weeks and the 70th week. See, we are dealing with the 70th week here in the book of Revelation. The prophetic clock of God was stopped, was paused by God's grace at the crucifixion and the resurrection. And the whole world was plunged into what we call an age of of grace. But if you can picture that second hand of the prophetic clock, it's been held back from advancing for almost 2,000 years. And very soon it's going to start ticking again. And the world will see, the world will experience, the world will be plunged into that 70th week, a specific seven-year period, a time of great tribulation, a time of transition that will birth in the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. And so the other mighty angel announced, there should be no more delay, no longer, But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. Now, we're still in this interesting interlude just before that seventh angel sounds his trumpet. So let's look at what's left. Let's look again at this little book in the angel's hand and the interesting invitation given to John. In verse 8, it said, Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. And so I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. I mean, imagine that, the aged apostle John, the last living apostle, so overwhelmed, but yet still finding, still summoning the courage to approach this massive angel and request, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and I ate it, and it was. It was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Now, I want to end this podcast today with a little personal story. Now, I may not have stood before an archangel. I may not have you know, approached him and requested to eat a little book, but as I have devoured the scriptures, I've encountered something really sweet and something really bitter. I, I remember when I first became a Christian and I first tasted that the Lord was good. I first saw the sweetness of, of his grace in his word, I was then uh, confronted with the bitter aspects, the bad news, as well as the good news. I remember sitting on my deck one night and, and thinking through how God has made only one way. And yes, we should rejoice that there's one way. <laughs> there is a way to get to heaven. But yet thinking through how you could have just made it another way, God. You could have made it so that there were so many ways. You could have you could have made it so that it was so much easier to get into heaven. And yet he didn't. He, he made a narrow way. And few find it. And that frustrated me. And I poured out my frustrations to the Lord. I poured out the bitterness that was in my belly to the Lord. And and yet after you do that and after he listens to you and after he hears you, you know, there there comes a point where you have to realize this is the way it is. There is one way. There's a narrow way. It's Jesus. There's the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. So once you finally fully accept that, then the only rational response to that is to preach the good news as well as the bad news to all peoples, nations, tribes, and tongue. And you know what? That There came a point where I devoted my entire life to that purpose, to preaching the good news as well as the bad news, the sweet and the bitter, to give people a clear opportunity to receive 
or to reject Jesus Christ. And I want to give you that opportunity right now. You've heard enough to make a decision. So make your decision. Do you receive the free gift of everlasting life that Jesus purchased with his blood on the cross? Or do you reject this way to be saved? Only to stand on your own before a holy God and give an account, a full account, of every errant thought, word, and deed. I I do not know how you could choose that second choice. I I could not conceive of how someone would rationally want that. And yet God loves you enough to respect your decision, even if it is to reject him. Now, please, I plead with you as an ambassador for Christ to receive the good news, to receive the grace of God, to receive the forgiveness of God. For God made him who had no sin to be sin for you so that in him you might become the righteousness of God. Receive the good news. Receive the grace of God and don't receive his grace in vain.